Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we are very excited that you're here and that we have these great panelists here today to talk about 3D printing. Is the law ready for the future? My name is Julie Ahrens. I'm the Director of Copyright and Fair Use here at the Center for Internet and Society. Just going to do a quick introduction of our panelists and then uh, just give you a rundown of how things are going to go. We're going to have um, Peter Wise, Mars Housen, and then um, Nora Engstrom, and then Mark Lemley do um, presentations. We'll have um, some discussion and responses to that, and then we'll open it up to questions. Um, and Brooke and Eric are here, and they are going to actually, after our discussion period is over around 2 o'clock, they're going to do demonstrations of these 3D printers that you see here. So let me just introduce our panelists. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Pete Weismarshausen, who is the founder and CEO of Shapeways.com, which is an online 3D printing marketplace um, and community. And Shapeways provides a platform for individuals to make, buy, and sell their own products. And so members upload designs, and they, or, or you choose from designs that others are sharing or selling. Um, and then Shapeways prints the products on demand so that you know each order is customized and personalized. Uh, then next we're going to hear from uh, Professor Nora Freeman Engstrom. She's a professor here at Stanford Law School. Uh, her scholarship lies at the intersection of tort law and professional ethics. She will be talking about the product liability issues and the uh, challenges that 3D printing uh, brings to enterprise liability theory. And then next we'll hear from Mark Lemley, who is also a professor here at Stanford Law School. He also directs the program in law, science, and technology uh, here at the school. He teaches intellectual property, computer and internet law, patent law, and antitrust. And he's going to discuss the issues surrounding um, intellectual property law and the issues that 3D printing raises in that space. Um, and then um, we have Brooke Drum, who is the founder and CEO of PrinterBot, a company that creates desktop 3D printers uh, that you can build at home. So Brooke started his company uh, with a Kickstarter campaign that raised over $800,000, and the company has set out to design the simplest 3D printer yet. They offer 3D printers that are priced as low as $399 uh, and go up to $1,000. $500 each. So, and then Eric Wolf is the intellectual is an intellectual property attorney, as well as the president of Airwolf 3D, a company that sells affordable, durable, and easy to use 3D printers. Uh, they offer they also offer do-it-yourself 3D printer kits, as well as fully assembled 3D printers uh, that range in price from just under $1,300 to $2,295. So they, you can see that this technology is quickly evolving and um, we can soon expect that everyone will probably have a 3D printer in their home. And so we're going to talk about what this means um, you know, in this legal space. So welcome and please join our panelists. Yeah. Um, so the question is where, wherever you like. All right. Um, so I'll talk then. Um, so first of all, thank you for the introduction and thanks for, uh, for inviting us. Um, so a little bit about Shapeways and why we're doing what we're doing. Um, I think the, the basic, uh, what we need to understand is going back to why is this uh, such an interesting thing? Um, and I think the best way to explain that is if we look around us, you know, we see that a lot of, uh, of the products that we use on a day-to-day -day basis um, they all look the same. Uh, if we look at our laptops, if we look at our telephones, if we look at our cars, if you look at the, the big scale of things, if you see a big parking lot, everything looks the same. And as a result, people start to customize the things they care about most. You know, you have the custom car scene where people go really crazy. You know, people put decals on their laptop, um, custom covers on their phones, etc. right? We like to show who we are. We like to express our own individuality. Um, and mass manufacturing has a problem with that. You know, customization after the fact works, but it's highly inefficient. Uh, it takes a lot of time, and sometimes you cannot get exactly what you want. 
And as a result, you know, uh, people, if you look on the internet already, you see services like Cafe Press, who was offering customization of products we use already for a long, long time. But the manufacturing of those custom products is always been, and still is to a point, uh, is a bit of a challenge. So how do we mix <clears throat> the benefits of mass manufacturing with uh, the benefits of giving people the products they really want? And um, I think that 3D printing uh, is a very, very smart way to do that. Um, it can print one-offs. Uh, you can also print hundreds or thousands of copies of the same thing. But because you're taking directly um, um, input from a digital domain and transform it to the real domain, um, a lot of the downsides that you see with mass manufacturing around setup time and setting up assembly lines, etc., go away because you go directly from a design file into a physical file. Um, so that's the reason why we, uh, I started Shapeways in 2007, and it's grown tremendously. Um, today, our community is over 300,000 people. We get over 60,000 product design files uploaded to our site every month. If you think about that, that's amazing. I mean, that means that in a little over two years, we have as many, we, if this stays the same, and actually it's accelerating, then in a little bit over two years, we get as many products as are available on Amazon, which is quite astounding. Um, so pretty soon we will have more products than Amazon, which is like really, really uh, weird to think about and really cool to see that a community of designers can get that. Um, then what we also do, and I think this is very important to understand because I already heard it in your introduction, that 3D printing is actually a misnomer and also a generalized term for a lot of different technologies. Um, Actually, 3D printing was used for one technology, and it's now the overall uh, name for all these technologies. Um, and what we do at Shapeways is we use high-end machines. Uh, there are a lot of benefits of, to that because they uh, give you the ability not only to print in plastics and very high quality, but it also gives you the ability to print in ceramic, um, in silver, in stainless steel, and in many more materials to come. Uh, wood is definitely possible, titanium, and then multiple materials will come. That's not to take away from the benefits of having a machine yourself. Of course, it's cool. Um, but there are several ways to, 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 to approach uh, the problem of how do we give access to anyone to make whatever they want, because that's really where we're going. You know, not so long ago, um, only a few big companies had access to manufacturing, uh, to the ability to make whatever they wanted as a company. And what they did, of course, is they find out what everybody wanted to buy, make those things and start to sell them in as many numbers as possible. And what 3D printing will do to society is give the ability to make whatever we want, even if it's only for ourselves, to anyone. And that's a fundamental shift. So you don't have to work for a company that makes stuff, you don't have to work for a factory to make stuff, um, but you can do it yourself. And that, of course, gives uh, raise to a whole set of interesting challenges and uh, puzzles that we are here to discuss also on the, on the legal side of things. Because what does that mean? If you can print something and then you start using it, um, who's uh, liable for uh, that product all of a sudden? Is that you? Is that the, the, the person who gave you the printer? Um, in the case of Shapeways, is it the service provider that made it for you? But, you know, if you're the designer, you know, it shouldn't it be you? I mean, that's very interesting questions. And then, of course, you have copyright. Uh, luckily, 3D printing still is so uh, uh, highly priced if you compare it to mass manufacturing in most cases that buying something that is copyright protected in a shop is typically more affordable than printing it yourself. So that's today prohibiting large copyright problems. But, of course, over time, as prices come down, uh, those things will become more of a question. Um, of course, easier to address again with a service than with a home printer, because how do you lock that up? Um, so that's a little bit of a, I don't know how much time you were, you were giving me, but uh, um, so that's a little bit. So multiple materials and actually the, the, the development of materials will continue. Um, you know, everybody can start making whatever they want in a democratized way. It's a little bit the same that happened uh, with software development. Uh, with the rise of the internet. Before the internet, software development and getting your software out there in the market was only possible for really big companies. Microsoft was one of them, and there were others. Um, but after the internet was uh, really uh, available to many people, you saw that software development started to go 
um, to the internet, and it meant that uh, you know we get updates to our software now on a daily basis, not on a yearly basis. Um, you know, but also collaboration on software and open source software, I think, would not be possible without the invention of the internet. And so let's think about open source design and collaborative design and what that means. I mean, the fact that you don't have inventory means that products can be improved all the time because you have no stock that you have to sell first. So and that's what we see on the platform of Shapeways with shops. People start selling stuff and um, their users give them feedback and all the time they improve. I mean, we see very rapid um, development of products and that is really cool. And it's the same that happens with open source. People can collaborate, listen to feedback, interact. And, um, and then of course, we will see products we've never seen before, which is really cool. All right? All right, I'm gonna take that from the user point here. Sure. Um, so Peter just mentioned that 3D printers uh, raise a number of product liability issues. And so those are the issues uh, I'm gonna flesh out. So I'm a torts person, as many of you know. I'm not a technology person, so hopefully I'm getting the technology right uh, as I apply it to tort law. So I'm gonna start by reviewing the basics of product liability, and then I'm gonna apply the principles we reviewed to the 3D printing context, highlighting uh, places where this application is apt to create some tension. Um, then I'm gonna identify one way in which applying uh, 3D printing uh, to product liability law raises an interesting theoretical puzzle, and I'm gonna try to do all this in, in about 10 minutes or less. So, so here we go. Um, and we'll start with a review of product liability law. So in general, as you guys probably remember from your 1L torts class, we have what we call strict liability for products. So this is the operative rule. One engaged in the business of selling or otherwise distributing products who sells or distributes a defective product is subject to liability for harm to persons or property caused by the defect. So that's the rule. Um, but obviously the sentence includes a few terms that need to be fleshed out. Um, and one is who exactly is covered. So strict liability applies not to everybody under the sun, but rather to seller. So right, so one engaged in the business of selling or otherwise distributing products. So what does this mean? How has this been applied in the case law? It means that non-commercial distributors or manufacturers aren't sellers who trigger strict liability. So as the case is made clear, a woman who cans tomatoes in her kitchen and sells the canned tomatoes to her neighbor that are, have botulism in it, um, she is not a seller for purposes of strict liability. So a child who makes lemonade and sells that lemonade to the lemonade stand, that child sure is selling lemonade, but the child is not a seller for purposes of strict liability. If your car gets old and you want to get a new car and you sell your car on eBay or on Craigslist, you're selling your car, but you are not a seller of automobiles for purposes of strict liability. So under the doctrine, it's really well established that non-commercial sellers of a product are only liable in tort if they've been negligent, if they fail to exercise reasonable care under the circumstances. Strict liability does not apply to them. All right, um, so that, establishes who a seller is. Going back to the general rule, the general rule next applies to products. So what's a product, you might ask? Cases establish that a product is tangible personal property, and this is actually in the third restatement, it wasn't in the second restatement. Um, defective intangible things are not typically products, so they don't trigger strict liability. So there's a case which says, uh, which involves the following. A tour uh, book, uh, book, so it was a voter's book, says, you know, this beach is great for swimming. I recommend everybody, you know, go swimming here at this beach in Hawaii. Turns out the beach is actually extremely dangerous for swimming with riptides. Somebody swims in the dangerous beach and gets pulled out to the ocean and drowned. Wants to sue the manufacturer, the printer of the book, 
for strict liability to say the book is defective, right? It's a defective product. I can touch it, and it's defective. I drowned because of my reliance on it. Um, and, and courts have, in that case and in other cases have been very clear that a book's author or publisher can't be sued via product liability law because content uh, in books and in other places is not a product. All right, so that's some quick and dirty on the basics of product liability law. So what happens when we take product liability law and we put it into the realm of 3D printing? So I have four uh, basic predictions slash observations for what we're going to encounter. Um, my first prediction is the following. More folks are going to start being hurt, uh, hurt by the products they themselves create with their own 3D printers. Right? So I own this 3D printer in my house. I make this really cool thing. It shatters. I'm hurt by it. Um, it's hard to see uh, who was on the hook for this. I'm the one who made uh, the product with my own 3D printer. So traditionally, the products you can make in your house, they're fairly simple and straightforward, and they're not particularly dangerous. So think what you've made in your house recently, right? Probably nothing that's too complex, right? Like maybe you canned tomatoes, maybe you made some lemonade, maybe you made, my son recently made a bird feeder, right? Um, you know, you know my, my mother-in-law makes a lot of quilts. Uh, none of these things are gonna hurt anybody. Um, but 3D, if 3D printing takes off, we'll have the ability to make things in our homes that can actually uh, hurt us quite severely. Um, we'll be able to make sophisticated and potentially dangerous products in our homes. Um, these homemade products are likely to injure us uh, and members of our families. And unless we can sue the creator of the code, which was fed into a printer, uh, to tell the printer how to behave, or the printer manufacturer uh, itself, uh, we're unlikely uh, to find uh, any deep pocket uh, from whom to recover. Um, so my view is that a lot more products, uh, a lot more folks are going to be injured by products where there's no real ability to have a product liability compensation. Um, the second and related prediction um, is we're going to see lots more litigation concerning who qualifies as a seller. Um, I said something ago that individuals are going to start uh, having the power to individually make more dangerous stuff. Um, they're also probably going to want to start selling some of the dangerous stuff that they create. Um, so regular folks are, are likely to start selling not just lemonade at a lemonade stand or canned tomatoes um, or the, you know, the pretty stuff you buy on Etsy right now, but sophisticated, complex, and potentially dangerous products. Um, yet many of these hobbyists, you know, we can call these folks hobbyists, you know, are not the traditional commercial sellers, um, and they're, they're not, therefore, sellers that, as that term has traditionally been defined in tort doctrine. So we're going to put a lot of pressure, I think, if, if injuries mount, uh, we're going to see uh, put a lot of pressure on the line between commercial and casual sellers of goods. Um, we'll either see the line stay where it is, which means a lot of folks are not going to be able to recover, or in typical common law fashion, the line might itself move a little bit to accommodate uh, more compensation for folks. Uh, and that would broaden uh, the definition of who qualifies as a commercial seller, triggering strict liability. Um, my third prediction is related. We're going to see a lot more litigation concerning what qualifies as a product. Um, and here, specifically, we're going to see a lot of litigation, I, I suggest, I, or I would guess, about whether the code that's fed into this printer that tells the printer what to print is itself a product that can trigger strict liability. Um, here, remember books, you know, are not, the, the information contained in books has consistently been held not to, to constitute a product. That was the, the dangerous speech example. Um, there are two fairly recent cases coming out of Colorado and, Cal uh, and Connecticut saying that video games are not products uh, because they aren't tangible property. Um, but at the same time, there are older cases coming out of the Ninth Circuit and the Second Circuit, which have found that inaccurate information contained in aeronautical charts um, is a product uh, 
So there are these old cases, or not really old, like eight cases, cases from the 80s, but which predate the third restatement, which has put more, um, on, more weight on this tangible idea. But there are cases out there which say information in aeronautical charts is a product. And on the whole, when you, when you kind of dig into this doctrine, you quickly come to the view that this question has not been uh, exhaustively uh, litigated and it hasn't been a particular, you know, answered in a particularly satisfying way. Um, so if 3D printing comes of age, I suggest that will rapidly change. Um, as information so directly leads to the creation of tangible personal property and potentially dangerous tangible personal property, we might see again in typical common law fashion uh, some blurring of the tangible and tangible line. Um, Finally, the final point is if we end up sweeping strict liability uh, into those who print dangerous items in their homes or to those folks who write the code, which then is fed into the printers to create the products, um, which, is, which admittedly is, is a fairly big if, I think, if that happens. Uh, but I, if it happens, I think it will raise an interesting theoretical puzzle as follows. So it will challenge uh, what we think of as enterprise liability. Theory. And enterprise liability theory, as you probably remember, is the theoretical justification uh, on which the doctrine of product liability logically rests. So when tort theorists are asked, why do we have strict liability for products? Why have we carved this area out? For anybody who's had me for torts members, I, I say, you know, we have a sea of negligence with little islands of strict liability in it, and, and products are on a little island. Well, why have we done that? Um, we usually talk about enterprise liability in one way or another, uh, we spin out the following syllogism. So we put liability on manufacturers um, and sellers because those who manufacture goods and sell goods, those folks tend to be enterprises, right? And putting liability on enterprises is generally thought to be socially beneficial. I and mean, this is in part because enterprises are great at pulverizing losses. So this point uh, dates back, as you probably recall, to the 1944 case of Scola versus Coca-Cola, where there, uh, Justice Traynor on the California Supreme Court writes, the cost of an injury and the loss of time or health may be an overwhelming misfortune to the person injured and a needless one, for the risk of injury can be insured by the manufacturer and distributed among the public as a cost of doing business. So the idea is enterprises are great at taking one overwhelming loss and pulverizing it, right? Like chopping it up into tiny bites and spreading it around so the loss, the, the effect of the loss is reduced. So here again, the idea is imposing liability on enterprises is socially beneficial. And here the syllogism plays out. Ergo, imposing liability on sellers and manufacturers is socially beneficial. Um, so what, is this, what does this have to do with 3D printing? The idea is, is, is as, as Peter said, 3D printing democratizes the manufacturing and the selling of complicated goods. And it severs the link between manufacturers and enterprises. It severs that identity, it decouples it. Anybody can now be a manufacturer uh, of complex goods in their garage or basement, and if strict liability does apply to those folks, it will unsettle the theoretical foundation of strict liability for products. talked about the democratization of, of manufacturing and, and Nora says that one of the things that that does is it severs the relationship between manufacturing and the enterprises that have traditionally engaged in it. Uh, what I want to talk about is a different sort of severing and that is uh, what, what 3D printing really uh, enables us to do from an IP perspective is to divide the act of invention uh, from the act of innovation. That is, it allows us to separate the people who actually create something, uh, who come up with the idea, who put together the design, from the act of manufacturing and distributing that product. Um, and in doing so, it presents an interesting theoretical challenge for intellectual property law, 
right? Because it requires us to confront why it is we have intellectual property protection. Uh, we say, generally, we have intellectual property protection to protect creators, designers, uh, because design and creation is a, is a costly uh, and uncertain activity. But oftentimes when we say that, what we mean is not so much that creation, invention is a costly activity, often it isn't, uh, but that the act of going from the spark of inspiration to getting a product out in the market in a mass way is a costly and uncertain activity. And what 3D printing does is it splits that uh, uh, it divides that issue, and so it, it requires us to ask, uh, do we really want an intellectual property regime uh, just to protect design in a world in which manufacturing and distribution are no longer expensive and uncertain prospects, uh, but in which they're, they're costless or pretty close to it? <clears throat> now, we have seen an example in intellectual property of this phenomenon before, and it's the internet. Right? The internet did exact for informational goods exactly what 3D printing promises to do for uh, for physical goods. That is to say, it divided uh, the creation of the thing from the distribution and production of the thing, and it made the production and distribution of the thing essentially costless. We're not yet at the point where 3D printing is costless, as Pete suggested. Uh, for many kind of low uh, value goods, it may be cheaper to buy a mass produced good than to have it uh, manufactured yet, but that's not gonna last, right? Uh, the world is quickly going to reach a point in which the limiting cost of your generation of any kind of physical good is the cost of the materials that you put into it. Uh, right, that you're going to have a printer in your house, or you're going to have a local printer uh, capable of generating something. Uh, and as we get competition, manufacturing and distribution become less and less important. <clears throat> well, what happened on the internet? From an IP perspective, as manufacturing and distribution became less and less important. <clears throat> First thing that happened is it was great for consumers. Right? We got access to information more quickly, more cheaply, and of a much greater variety than we have ever had before. Um, and we did that notwithstanding the sort of threats of the intellectual property lawyers that, oh my god, no one's going to create this stuff. You know, there are people writing as late as 1995 in law review articles, nothing goods on the internet because there's no effective copyright protection, so no one would create anything and put it on the internet. That was nonsense in 1995. It was clearly nonsense by, by 1998 or 1999. <clears throat> so consumers benefited from the democratization of production and distribution from the fact that information uh, was often available free or, or for close to it. Wasn't so great for intellectual property owners, right? If your goal is to control the distribution of your information, or if your goal is even without controlling it to make a profit from the distribution of that information, the internet's a nightmare. Right? Because the internet means that I now have to sue not the people who are engaged in uh, running counterfeiting uh, facilities that generate disks uh, and therefore have a factory and have a distribution network of trucks and have a bunch of people who sell those counterfeit disks out on the street. Now my counterfeiters are everybody, right? They're my customers, they're anybody at home who's got a computer. <coughs> And so what we did in the internet was uh, we saw the move by intellectual property owners uh, upstream. Right? Rather than sue the people who are actually engaged in infringement, uh, we decided to be far more efficient to sue people who are themselves the intermediaries. If we can find a choke point, a way to stop the distribution of our copyrighted content, uh, not by going after 70 million people who are passing songs around, uh, but by, uh, but by uh, cutting it off at the source or at some point through which it passes, well, that's a much more efficient uh, way to go. So what we saw were efforts by copyright owners, first and foremost, to ban technology. Right? Uh, we came within a hair's breadth of banning the VCR as a dangerous technology that facilitated acts of copyright infringement. And there was a sort of serious argument by copyright owners, I think in all good faith, that uh, the world will collapse, or the world will end, we will not have any creation anymore if you allow the creation of machines that facilitate the copying of anything by anyone in their home. 
Uh, fortunately, I think from a historical perspective, we rejected that call in the Supreme Court in a five to four decision um, uh, called Sony. Uh, but then we got to the question of, all right, well, if I'm not going to ban the technology, I ought at least to put it under control. Right? Uh, we ought to be, we ought to limit who has access to these technologies and we ought to uh, make them uh, comply with certain uh, rules to allow the uh, copying of material only in some circumstances. Uh, and some of that litigation is still going on. Uh, by and large, copyright law has managed to reject at least the most stringent forms of that, although we've shut down a whole bunch of intermediary companies along the way where we thought that the primary effect of that company was going to be to allow people to copy other people's designs uh, and creations uh, without paying. Uh, we've imposed some kinds of technological mandates, some kinds of limitations on what it is your device can do, and we've kind of coerced more. So that even the companies that have not actually been uh, uh, prevented from operating in the marketplace have you know, voluntarily agreed under the cloud of possible copyright litigation uh, to uh, run things like YouTube's content ID service to find infringing materials and take them off or to uh, implement a uh, six strikes and you're out program for repeat infringers on uh, copyright and so forth. If we can't ban and we can't control technologies, copyright owners, I think, will ultimately sort of fall back on, well, uh, at least we want to be compensated for the harm that your technology causes, right? That the people who provide the technology that facilitates acts of infringement ought to have to pay us something, right? Maybe we can't stop them, maybe we can't direct them into certain socially approved forms, but at a minimum they ought to have to contribute either in the way of paying copyright damages or in the way of paying some sort of a tax or a levy designed to fund uh, uh, designers and innovators. Well, who are the intermediaries in the 3D printing world? Uh, you know, I think from a market perspective, we haven't fully answered that question. We're still shaking it out, but let me offer some, uh, some possible examples. Um, uh, the, most, uh, the easiest example, uh, sorry Pete, in some sense, is the uh, print to order business model. Right? If, your, if your business model is not, I'll sell you a printer, do what you like with it, but I have a great industrial printer here and I will print whatever you send me, you are an intermediary. You are not yourself engaged in the, uh, the design of the product. You're not uh, necessarily in a position to pass on whether that product infringes a copyright or other IP right, uh, but you are nonetheless a nice convenient choke point uh, for, an, for a copyright owner to come after and say, well, uh, you're in the business of generating these copyrighted works, and so you're uh, liable when they're made. Um, second, I think even in the absence of a, of a printing uh, business, a print order business, uh, I think we see as an intermediary, and here a more, more direct analogy to the internet, uh, the design host system. Right? So somewhere out there are uh, groups of designs that people have posted. Uh, people are hosting them. Sometimes they're hosted by the people who themselves do the printing. But you can imagine right, hosts uh, entirely independent of uh, the printers right, who host designs uh, that you can then print at home by downloading to your computer. Uh, those host sites look a lot like the YouTubes uh, or other uh, content hosts of the internet, right? We are holding information, not physical goods, uh, and we're doing it in a way that is um, uh, you know, not transparent to us. You can post any design you want to the site. We can't really vet it to know whether it infringes a copyright. Um, but uh, we're a potential choke point because that's a nice convenient place for IP owners to go and say, here are all of the designs on your site that are infringing and now you need to take them down. Finally, you might imagine people going after the printer makers themselves, uh, even if the business is uh, put the printer at home. Um, right? uh, just as we went after the makers of the VCR in the early days of, of internet copyright, I think it's quite plausible that you might imagine uh, IP owners saying, this is a device which is designed to enable people to avoid intellectual property protection by generating infringing copies of any kind of works. And yeah, it has some other uses too, uh, but uh, we ought to ban that device or at least regulate it in some way uh, in order to achieve that result. Now, the good news is, 
some of the copyright development in the internet space actually ends up providing some uh, breathing room, or probably will, uh, from a copyright perspective for 3D printing. The Sony case and the Sony doctrine it creates, uh, while people have tried to whittle away at it from the copyright owner's perspective, I think provides a pretty strong model that says, we're not gonna hold you liable for selling a 3D printer, merely because that 3D printer can be misused. Uh, <clears throat> The Digital Millennium Copyright Act uh, creates a series of internet safe harbors, and those safe harbors may help the people who are in the design hosting business by saying, as long as you take down infringing designs when they are brought to your attention and comply with various rules that we have created, you yourself will not be liable for hosting a bunch of designs, many of which are infringing, uh, as long as you don't know that you are hosting specific infringing designs and keep them up anyway. So that's the good news from an IP perspective. Um, the bad news from an IP perspective is the other thing 3D printing does is it moves us beyond copyright. Right? Some of the things, many of the things that you can print would be copyrighted. This, this is a sculpture. Um, uh, but many of them will also end up being protected by design patents. And design patents have some rather different characteristics than copyright law. First off, we got nothing like the limits we have established in the internet space from copyright. There is no Sony stable article of commerce doctrine and design patent law. There's not, not the opposite, we just haven't thought about it yet. Uh, there is no DMCA safe harbor. Uh, the DMCA safe harbors apply only to copyright, not to design patent rights. Um, there is um, no requirement in design patents that you copy. Uh, you infringe a design patent if your design is too similar to someone's patented design, even if you came up with it yourself. What that means is that even efforts to really try to weed out those people who got their designs from an infringing source are not going to be effective when it comes to design patents. What I really need to do is have a design patent lawyer read all the design patents in the world and compare them to the uh, entire list of products in the Shapeways database, larger than all the list of products in Amazon, uh, and say, oh yeah, some of these are too similar. Well, good luck, right? Um, it's pretty easy to get design patents. Uh, and if you uh, sue to, uh, uh, for design patent infringement and you win, the statutory rule says the, that you are entitled to the defendant's entire profit uh, from the making of the uh, thing, not uh, the, the defendant's profit attributable specifically to the design patent over everything else they did, but the defendant's entire profit. Uh, so I think that what we're going to see in intellectual property is a coming fight, not so much in copyright, but in design patents, uh, where we haven't settled a bunch of these issues. Now, where does that leave us long term? Imagine, fast forward to a world in which uh, 3D printing is cheap uh, and ubiquitous, people have them uh, and, or could have them in their homes, uh, and you can print lots of different things with them. I think there are two possible futures for us to contemplate. Uh, in the long term. One is, to me at least, a dystopian future. It's a future of lockdown. Right? This is a future in which the intellectual property forces sign up with the uh, uh, tort liability plaintiff's forces and the kind of four horsemen of the, of the apocalypse from the internet world to say, oh my god, people can make really bad stuff. We can't let people make really bad stuff in their houses because they'll make really bad stuff. Um, people can print guns. We've got to ban the printing of guns. But it turns out to actually be really hard to ban just the printing of guns with a 3D printer because you can't track down and eliminate all of the information that would allow you to do it. Um, uh, and uh, anybody can do it in their, in their own home. So maybe what we really have to do is we've got to ban 3D printers or at least register them. Uh, a, a California state senator has already introduced legislation uh, that says, well, 3D printing, you should have to register and get permission from the government to own a 3D printer. We should treat this as a licensed technology, basically like a munition. I want a background check before anybody's allowed to own a 3D printer. Right? You can imagine a lockdown scenario in which for some combination of bad people do bad things and the economic power of the intellectual property community uh, saying, we just don't want this technology to spread too far because we saw what happened on the internet uh, when it became easy and cheap for people to move their own content and we don't want that happening for physical products.
A second and more optimistic, uh, for me at least, uh, but also really quite challenging uh, uh, future, I think, is to ask us to adjust uh, to a world without scarcity. We've had to do that to some extent in the internet already. Uh, what 3D printing and its kind of promise does is it, it offers us for tangible goods what the internet has offered us for information, right? And that is, frankly, the absence of scarcity. Now that's a really scary concept to an economist like me because all economics is based in some sense on scarcity. Uh, intellectual property is about taking something which is naturally free and abundant and easily replicable and making it look scarce. It's restricting it in order to fit it into an economic model, an economic framework that we understand and can work with. Well, people will buy it because there are only a few of them and you can only get them from one source. The interesting questions, I think, uh, for the economy in the long run, in a world in which 3D printing isn't locked down, in which it does become ubiquitous, right, are um, what happens? Uh, do people, in fact, design? I think the evidence from the internet, I think the evidence so far from 3D printing is that the answer is yes, uh, at least uh, with kind of certain pockets of exceptions, right? It's not the case that the fact that you can get information for free on the internet has caused people not to create. Quite the contrary, we've seen an explosion of creativity unprecedented in human history, uh, in part because we've made it easier for people to generate products who never could have done so before, whether those products are videos or music or now uh, uh, devices, spare parts, uh, uh, new functioning products, and so forth. Um, so I think from a social perspective, right, that's, a, that's a revolution. If we have it, that's a really valuable one. It can fundamentally change the way in which we operate. But it's also a really scary one, not only if you're in the business of manufacturing and moving physical things from one place to another, in which case your business model is probably in some jeopardy, uh, but also because it requires us to think about how the economy operates in a world in which uh, we can all make our own stuff. Um, and I don't think that, I think there's going to be an answer to that question, but I don't think we've really started to think about what that answer might be. Um, thank you. Thanks to Peter and Nora and Mark for their comments. And um, now I want to give a chance for Eric and Brooke to respond to what they've heard or um, say something else. And then uh, I'll ask a question and then we'll open it up for questions. So, um, Brooke, why don't you go first and then Eric? Okay. I'm going to stand just to be comfortable. So, um, you know, I got into this business because I wanted to make stuff, right? And you kind of get excited about what is possible with the 3D printer and then you hear all these questions come up. So I'm basically scared to death right now. <laughs> you're hearing this. No, um, you know, they, they call the 3D printing world right now the wild, wild west, right? And, and it's that way because we can all, I mean, you guys can go out and form a 3D printing company right now, come up with a design and make your own printer, come up with something to print that can't, can't be done with a machine and you can have a business, right? So the wild, wild west for sure. Um, but now we're making sharp sticks and guns, right? So it, it's truly looking uh, like it's a little scary. Well, a couple of things I want to I want to throw into in the context of, of what I've heard so far, and and one is, um, you know, we don't have scanners here, but one big question that I have this is more of a question than any answers, but you know, scanners are starting to become really really um, interesting, and so the ability to scan something and to uh, replicate it right there in, in basically perfect scale. Um, now, it is hard to, it's funny that people say you can build anything with these things. No, you really can't. Um, the, first of all, you wouldn't want to build some things out of plastic, right? So only some things can be sent to Peter and be useful, made out of metal. So there is kind of a limitation with the, the home uh, printers that we have, that you can't make anything. But you could scan something that, that is copyrighted for sure. Um, I, I was sitting here listening and I kind of wondered, um, just as a layman, you know, what I do with my printer is I, I uh, fix things around my house. So I fix the, you know, the washer on my wife's washing, or the knob on my, my uh, wife's washing machine that had been broken for, you know, 20 years. Uh, I fixed, most recently, um, it's not fancy, but it, it's cool to me, uh, my toilet broke. You know, the little handle finally broke, you know. And I'm like, man, I could go down and buy something that was made in China, but I'm going to spend the two hours, the most expensive toilet handle I've ever seen. <laughs> and I, I took a picture of it. 
And then I literally brought that in and I traced it. And then I printed it. And so when I was done, it looked exactly like the, the thing that I replaced. Um, but on a practical level, of course, I wasn't really worried about getting sued. But I wonder, you know, you, if you kind of think, wow, what, what are people going to be uh, replicating that could take some profit out of some manufacturer's hands? I don't know. Um, one other thing is... Uh, this is for the people on the internet. Oh, great. Can they hear? So... I'll just... Yeah, there it is. Okay. So another, another thing, too, is, um, you know, where these things are used. Every time that I come to a conference, I, I try to carry my small printer. So the, the, the wood one there is called the Junior. And so I, I put it in my backpack, and I take it, you know, through the airport. And the first time I did that, I told my wife, I'm like, ah, I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> you know, we're going to London for a print show. And so I put it, you know, I, I just put it in the bag and I send it through. And I'm telling you, people freaked out, right? They're like, it, it, you know, you look at the x-ray and it kind of does look like what I imagine a bomb would look like. There's wires and boxes and, and things coming out and plastic in there. So, um, you know, like three security guards kind of pile around and look at this thing and they're running it back and forth and they're looking around and I'm just standing there waving, that's me. And so they brought me over to this secure area and uh, they they literally just like put it out on the counter like, what is this? I'm like, it's a 3D printer. Have you heard of them? And they're like, no. What does it do? <laughs> you know, <laughs> eh, make stuff. You know, it's like a little robot with the hot glue gun on the end. You know, and so they, you know, they they bring over the test and they pat it all down and they take it back and they're like, okay, go on through. Well, I've done that several times now, and now it's funny because you know people are kind of finding out about this. Um, I, I went through uh, most recently in Sacramento, going to uh, Washington, D.C., where we actually got to talk with lawmakers and congressmen about these issues. And uh, so I, I sent it through, and I, I, I've learned, don't leave it in the bag, you know, put it on like a computer. So I just take it out, and sometimes people behind me kind of step back. <laughs> and, uh, but, but the guy right in front of me was like, oh, cool, 3D printer. I'm like, you know what that is? And he goes, yeah, I, I made one for my buddy. I have a laser cutter. I made one. So, yeah, I've seen those. I was like, well, this is getting better, right? And so it went through the, uh, the scanner, and I was kind of waiting for that moment when people are like, woo, you know, called the cops or whatever. But uh, so the guy at the x-ray thing um, just gave me the thumbs up and like, robots, awesome. <laughs> So, but what I think they haven't thought of is something I did last year coming back from uh, London from that same print show. Yes. One minute. Oh, one minute. Okay. Uh, I actually printed on the plane. So I can run my, uh, my printers on battery. And so I said, honey, hold the blanket. You know, and so she's like, what are you doing? I was like, just hold on. And so I warm it up, and uh, I'm using PLA, right? So it's, uh, it kind of smells nice. It doesn't smell like plastic. And I thought, maybe they'll think it's lunch. <laughs> so anyway, and I, I printed this little blob. It didn't turn out very good because my battery ran out. But I did print. So it starts to make you wonder, are, are people going to want these things being used in any kind of context? Um, I predict not. Uh, but one last thing I just wanted to mention. The other thing that um, maybe not a lot of people are aware of is um, we're, we are working just from a, a, a university in England that um, released a white paper on how you can make filament conduct electricity. So we've taken that recipe and been working on it. And so this is uh, called Carbomorph. And this can actually print electronics. So current can run through this at a useful rate so that there's not so much resistance that it, it, you can make small, simple electronics with this. So I think some of the copyright issues are going to even reach into not just moving mechanical parts, but also even electronics. So the plot thickens. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, I've heard some, some really great presentations. Uh, I myself am a, still an attorney. Uh, I, I thought I was getting away from it, but here I am back in. Uh, and uh, our product is the Airwolf uh, printer over there. And I don't know how much I can add to what Brooke said, because Brooke really laid out uh, the case of 3D printers and, and how they work and why they're so important. But there are a couple things that uh, were really, uh, I don't know what the answers to them are gonna, going to be. And one of them is the scanners. And with the 3D printing technology, we're pretty well advanced, at least in terms of plastic. We can really get an incredible amount of detail with these printers. 
But the scanning technology is not there yet. While you can take a scanner and go over an object, there's still a lot of post-processing that's involved. It's not as simple as just taking a scanner to the bottle and hitting print on the printer. When that technology, I think that's the ultimate bottleneck to this next series of questions or issues, as we might call them, arises. When that technology gets to the point where we can maybe just take a couple pictures of that bottle and then replicate it, I think that's where we truly see the disruption. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Uh, because then you have someone in their garage or at home who sees a toy in the store that they really like and they just take a couple pictures of it and then they have it printed out in an hour at home. Um, at that point, I think you have an intersection of copyright, uh, utility patents, design patents, just about everything at the same time. So is there a way to protect those objects, to put some type of code in the physical structure in them so that when a scanner uh, looks at them, the scanner will know not to reproduce it, kind of like a, a disk. Who knows? But that's going to be an interesting topic for discussion. The other thing that uh, I think is really fun about 3D printing is that it's constantly, iter it's an iterative process. Uh, our machine has over 200 different versions, actually. Uh, we revise it every couple weeks, and the machines actually can make themselves. So you can redesign them and redesign them and redesign them until they get basically like bulletproof. And uh, it's, it's just, I think it opens up such a world uh, that we haven't seen before for people who really like to work with their hands um, and who haven't previously been able to so easily design something in, in space, in their mind, and actually have it happen without having to use a welder or carve the wood, they can just, from idea to reality, in just a matter of hours, something we haven't previously seen before. And I think that that's just gonna open up a, a new world of possibility for, for a lot of people that have those skills that we haven't necessarily seen before. Um, and uh, the final thing I was gonna say is the other neat thing about 3D printing, and it's kind of like what Brooke was saying, is we're printing in biodegradable materials and biofriendly materials now. And what, it, what does that lead us to? We, we, there's the talk about 3D printing and guns, which we don't want to talk about too much, I understand, but where do, where do we go with all this biodegradable possibilities? Do we build cars out of biodegradable plastic and then put them to compost when we're done with them? Weapons, there, there are so many possibilities for these biodegradable materials, and yes, they're eco-friendly, but too, also, they completely disintegrate afterwards. So I think that the world is definitely going to change because we have the internet and information is disseminated so fast now. It might not be 10 years from now. It might be more like two to three years where everything is completely different. Everybody has a 3D printer uh, at their home. So anyway, thank you very much for your time. And I'd be more than happy to answer any questions during the demonstrations. Thank you. Thanks, Brooke. Thanks, Eric. So um, I am going to take the moderator's privilege and get to ask the first question. But for people who have questions, please line up here or over here behind the microphone area. And uh, that's so that the people who are on the internet can uh, hear us. And then we're going to talk until 2 o'clock. And then at 2 o'clock, um, Eric and Brooke are going to demonstrate how the printers work. So people who can stay, please do stay. If you have friends here at the law school who couldn't come to the lunch, they should come in and check it out because they're going to show these printers for an hour and they're pretty amazing. Um, so, so my first question is, those of us who have seen the Broadway musical Avenue Q know that the internet is for porn. And my question is about this technology is, can we use 3D printing for porn? Like, is this going to be a <laughs> functionality or what? Because we know that that's the generator for beepers, for the internet. Okay, that was just a joke. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be yes, right, yes. Peter? I mean, we, I guess we can just look at the Shapeways database and see what designs are up there. Check it out. Okay, so my, my question is, my actual question is, you know, we've talked about, you know, sort of in the product liability, um, dangerous goods category, um, we, you know, we have this question of where the choke points are if you want to have, if, if uh, there's a force push for regulation. And um, the code that creates the object is one obvious source of the, of the problem, um, and yet we haven't seen uh, a lot of regulation for code, where software code is dangerous, and here we have code that can cr create a potentially dangerous object. Uh, 
object. Let's imagine that it's something like a shoe design where the it's unstable and you'll trip down the stairs or the heel will break and you'll fall. Um, so, so whether in product liability or in negligence, um, you know, we, it, it's hard to go after the platform for that because we have CDA 230. Um, it, it's hard to go after the printer manufacturer for that because it's a staple article in commerce. It's good for so many different things. Um, is it, are we going to see people going after the, uh, the coders, the, those who've written the software? And, and since we've had so little of this kind of regulation of, of software in the past, um, will this be where we see serious clashes between the idea of code as speech and the freedom to tinker movement and this, pu this push for regulation? And wh where might that play out? Is this like the thin edge of the wedge for regulating software in this category and maybe also for other, um, for other purposes as well? Nora, you want to? Yeah, I'll start with this. So I think, you know, as I said in my remarks, I think, you know, to say that the code is a product and we'll go with product liability for this, I think that's a stretch. Um, it's not tangible. And as I said, the, you know, the law could evolve to, to catch it, but um, without evolving, without stretching current doctrine, I don't see that that's uh, very promising. Also, it seems you know, the folks who write the code, we, in law, we tend to follow the money, right? For liability, you look for the deep pocket. It seems to me that, that the person writing the code, and you guys know more about this than I do, is probably not the deep pocket. Um, I, I see a lot of hobbyists, um, you know, in their garages uh, writing this kind of code, uh, which is not necessarily where we want to be. Also, it sounds like there's so much code out there that this is a place where it's, you know, for chokehold, we tend to think of where there are just a few players, as Mark was saying, and you try to find the place where there are a few players and operate within those players. And, and the folks who are writing the code, you know, if there are you know, more products than Amazon, uh, it seems like there are a whole lot of those folks, and those folks would be actually really hard to, to get. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I don't think there's anything set in stone about the idea that historically we haven't uh, subjected uh, software and informational content to, to tort liability. I mean, it, it's 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 developed that way. But one of the reasons it developed that way was that we didn't really think of software as uh, capable of causing enormous harm. Right? We thought of the things that were going to cause real serious bodily injury as being you know physical things. Right? I, and you know that's just not true in the modern world. And so I think yeah, come the first major uh, uh, cybersecurity attack that leads to some real uh, harm uh, in this country. My guess is you're going to find tort liability uh, popping up. Uh, you're going to find uh, potential, you know, criminal liability, government liability popping up, and the fact that it's informational content is going to be uh, is not going to be enough to, to prevent that. Peter, did you want to respond to that, or we can take questions? No, I think. I think most is said. I, I think the, the cat is a bit out of the bag. Um, um, if you talk about the code as being the design files, making those design files is done with 3D software. And it used to be that 3D software was horrendously expensive, um, but uh, over time, um, you know, free 3D software has popped up. Uh, packages like Blender led the way, but then SketchUp followed and others. And uh, since there is now open source 3D software, uh, which you can compile in your own computer, um, it's really software that we're talking about, uh, not code in the sense of the design file. So I think the cat is out of the bag there. And since uh, it's also been mentioned that the wrap-up is an open source design where you can create with almost household um, items, you can create your own 3D printer. The only thing is, that is really hard to get is the extruder. Um, the cat is out of the bag there as well. So uh, finding a choke point is going to be extremely hard unless we want to use very blunt instruments. Um, I can name them, but you can <laughs> use your own imagination. So. Let's start over here. One. Can, we'll can I make oh, one quick comment? Actually, I'm. Just real quickly, I do think it's interesting that the gentleman that posted the files for the gun, um, the Liberator, mm -hmm. uh, he, you know, has been standing on those free speech, you know, laws and everything. A self-proclaimed anarchist, you know, you wouldn't expect him to give, but the government just said, "Can you take those down?" And he did. But that doesn't mean you can't find them. No, the fifty thousand, <laughs> fifty thousand downloads. I'm sure they're posted everywhere. My question relates to the tort stuff too, and it's brief. Um, uh, right now, I can download or you know acquire um, uh, plans 
to build anything from a house to even an airplane. And the plans uh, expect me to provide the materials and even machine some of the parts. I assume that there's a threat of law that relates to the liability that's uh, arisen out of accidents involving plans that were not followed precisely. And uh, I assume also that, that those plans have been viewed as, as products. So, so it seems to me that that would be the natural kind of foundation for drawing analogies into the space for legal doctrine. And yet, I don't hear anybody mentioning that. Yeah, I don't. I haven't seen those cases. Um, I've, I've, you know, fooled around quite a bit on its restatement section, third restatement section 19, and the cases cited therein, which uh, lay out the distinction between. Uh, tangible and intangible goods, and you do see these these cases from the 80s about aeronautical charts. Um, but you know, it could be that they're out there, uh, but they're not. When you look at the you know when you know when you look at the treatises, when you look at the restatement, when you look at the cases that cite the cases in the restatement, uh, those cases don't come up. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so this is why I said you know that that you know when you look there there is doctrine there, but it's it's. This has not been per pervasively litigated. Uh, and one of my predictions was we're about to see a whole lot more litigation on the line between tangible and intangible. Do, do you think I'm right in, in seeing a pretty close uh, analogy between uh, you know, paper plans for an airplane, for instance, and a 3D CAD you know, instruction for printing something on a 3D printer? I think one difference that may explain why you don't see the cases that Nora's talking about is it's traditionally been the case that if you drew up plans and I manufactured the thing, we had a business relationship. And so there's certainly lawsuits of that type, but they tend to be in the context of a contract that we had uh, and a con that contract might limit liability or, or, or say we're going to take it to arbitration or whatever else. Yeah. And what's, what's different, I think, about this world is now the provider of the plans uh, might not be in privity at all with the person who's actually going to implement the plans. They've got no business relationship. It just happens that they're out there. Right, right. But you could, you could. Yeah. I, have, I have two questions. Uh, first, for Peter, Eric, and Brooke, are you intending to go to the Maker Fair this weekend? Because I'm going to bring my seven-year-old son. I have a ball. If you saw your. Yes, we are there. Oh, you really? Okay, um, that's great. Um, second question for Mark. Mark, do you think you're going to see an expansion of a design patent, um, scope of a design patent, maybe a new, a new claim, a new form of a new claim such that a claim would cover sending a design electronically? Because right now, they, you know, if somebody has a slight difference, the design patent would so right. You, you think that's a possibility? Yeah. So I mean, I think we. So we've already started to see some some expansion in the in the definition of kind of breadth for infringement purposes, right? So the Egyptian goddess case, I think, opens up the possibility that if my design looks enough like yours that an ordinary observer is going to think they're the same, that we'll find infringement there. But but I think we will see expansion in a sec second dimension, which I think is what you're talking about, uh, and that is towards this idea of secondary liability, contributory design. Yeah patent infringement, right? Vicarious design patent infringement inducement. And in every other area of IP law, right, as we've, as we've found economically significant entities who are helping other people to infringe, we've expanded IP law to cover them, uh, at least in some circumstances. And so I don't know that there's a lot of contributory design patent infringement right now, but I would expect that the court would say, yeah, if, you're, if you provided the blueprints or plans that enabled someone else to engage in design patent infringement, you're an inducer. You're, you're the one who's causing them to do it, even though you're not the one who pulled the trigger on the, on the printer. Could you see a new format for the a design claim where it's, it's not just the look and appearance, but a design and then sending that design over electronic? Uh, so, so that the design itself would be uh, infringed by, directly infringed by the, by the uh, pattern rather than the implementation in yeah. three dimensions. So it's interesting, I, you know, traditionally in design patent law, the answer has been no, but we've started to blow that up with the uh, computer icon cases. So there, a lot of the design patent litigation that goes on right now are designs that are on the screen of your phone. They don't actually have any physical tangible form. Theoretically, we, 
what we used to say was, well, they've got to be, what you've got to show us is a device, a physical thing, and then just to highlight this as the important part. Uh, but now we've kind of backed away even from that so that simply kind of drawing a dotted line in a circle around the whole thing says, oh, yeah, well, the, this, this design applied somewhere. And if, you're, if it can be applied on a computer screen, I don't see why it couldn't be applied in a, in a, in a design Maybe. file for a 3D printer. As a patent prosecutor, should we be, could we or should we be writing claims of a design and then sending that design electronically? So I wonder how, this, how sending that design electronically fits in with existing design patent law, but if you could get at the problem by just not tying it to a physical substrate, right, that is using the image itself as one of the claims in the design. Yeah. Uh, just uh, I wanted to say thanks, Mark, for bringing up the whole notion, although I don't feel anybody picking up on it too much, is the uh, whole fundamental structure by which we are, our law is based. And that is, is the whole notion of capitalism, uh, which is the scarcity and so on. And I think that this is an opportunity, the, the manufacturing process is an enormous opportunity for the legal community to pick up on that and move out of that paradigm, which is dead and broken for about 80 years now, and the life support systems are starting to fail. But what I'm really, the, the question I have is, is do we see the possibility where um, patent law is going to get moved from a civil tort type of thing into the criminal domain the same way copyright did? Boy, I hope not. Um, I, you know, I, so what, I mean, one of the things that's kept patent law, uh, I think, uh, away from that is we've, uh, is that we don't have any requirement of copying, uh, right? And so it's, it's much harder to call patent infringement a moral wrong that we ought to punish if the answer is the person who's getting sued, as it is 95% of the time, is not someone who copied the design from you, but someone who came up with a similar design on their own. Now, what may happen, right, is, is uh, we actually see a lot more copying uh, in a world in which I can just sort of pull down a design and use it, and I don't really know where it came from. Um, I, um, you know, I don't. Because I, I, what that generally does is, by moving it into uh, criminal law, now it becomes a publicized, uh, pub, publicized uh, cost. The public generally covers it because now it's the state. So that's that's right. Although, I, to me, the, the 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 most significant effect is what it does. Is it really it, it, it's designed to deter people and scare them off, right? Uh, and it's one thing to say I might get sued for patent infringement. It's another thing to say I might go to jail if I use a three D printer. Um, well, and then there's a conflict of interest there too, because so much of the end, uh, so much of the high level people are playing in the the prison industrial complex, which could the benefit from that. Oh, we, get, we can get a quick question. You uh, sure? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I, was just, oh, I was just wondering if there, actually this is for Nora and Mark particularly, is there a legal precedent for um, changing a law, uh, particularly in this fast-moving industry, when, where you can show that a community has already been self-policing and they have created like a functional legal system? So I'm speaking to the idea of something like com uh, Creative Commons, um, which is a way for people to share their designs at the moment, saying like, hey, I made this design, feel free to use it, just give me credit. And then we create this culture of like rewarding creativity by the number of times something's been riffed on. So I created an iPhone case, and then these people made it better, but I'm, I'm still getting kudos from the design community because I was the original creator. Whether or not they end up making money from it is another a whole other thing. But as we're looking to, like, Congress is going to pass some sort of laws soon about regulating this the 3D printing industry. So if we can show them that there's already a community who have worked this out and it's effective, is there a legal precedent for that happening? So I, I guess what I would say is, I, and I, I didn't have time to talk about the open source aspects of this, but I actually think that's, the, that's in some sense the closest analogy here, right? So there clearly is precedent for uh, uh, a group, especially a closed-knit group, taking a legal regime that they think doesn't work for them and modifying it within their own framework, right? And open source is a, is a classic example of that, right? Copyright is not what this subset of the software development community thinks is is actually going to drive innovation. Let's take it and uh, and uh, adjust it for our own purposes. I guess what I would say, I think the lesson from open source and maybe the lesson more generally is that works within that community, 
and it works right up until the point in which someone outside that community is harmed, uh, right? But once, uh, so uh, open source, I think, actually works great within the open source community. Uh, it doesn't work well uh, in patent law, in part because somebody from outside the community can say, you're infringing my patent, and I don't care that everyone in your group has agreed to open sharing. I'm outside, and I haven't agreed to open sharing. So I think the, I, I think it doesn't hurt to say, uh, here are a bunch of people who are creating and, and, and we don't actually want uh, stronger intellectual property protection, right? We don't want to make this criminal. We don't want to do this. Uh, but the real question is going to be, are there a bunch of people outside that community who can say, I'm being hurt? You're using my designs. They're the ones that are in the, uh, in the uh, uh, design hosts and so forth. Cool. Thank you. Okay, so um, now I'm going to uh, ask if Eric and Brooke can fire up the machines, and I think people want to see how it's happened. Do you guys want to get started and then let people come up and take a close look, or is that I how you'd like to do it? Okay. I think so, yeah. um, you know, we've heard a lot today. Go, go please, please do. Um, we've heard a lot today, um, particularly because of the the people that we've been able to get to come here and show us the machines, and because of um, Peter and the Shapeways business about um, consumer facing uses of 3D printing. But I don't think it um, takes a a huge flight of imagination to imagine what the world looks like when this is in general commercial use. I mean, maybe we never have hardware stores anymore. Maybe all those manufacturing plants that take up acres and acres of land and are surrounded by all those parking lots, we don't need that land to be used for that anymore. Um, what happens when we can, you know, right now, we have um, doctors who are doing scanning and then making 3D models of people's hearts before they operate on them so they can understand better, you know, sort of in a 3D way, how to attach the arteries and what's close to what and that kind of thing. Are we going to be able to develop body parts using that exact same technology once we can extrude different um, biological materials that the body wants? Won't reject. Um, what, are we going to have replicators like on Star Trek where they can make food for us and instead of coming home and slaving for an hour I press the button and it's cocoa van it looks really nice um, and and of course the this and that's all awesome but of course the scary question about what happens when we do have um, 3d printers that can print other 3d printers and then it's Skynet, and you know we're all gone. Just don't let them network. That's yeah, my exactly. To you. No, that's that's what the regulation <laughs> ought to be. So, um, thank you all for coming. I hope you guys enjoyed this panel, and I hope you'll enjoy the demonstrations. And please join me in thanking our panelists who uh, may be leaving. <laughs> Hopefully, you guys will see some of these guys um, at Maker at a uh, Maker Fair over the weekend. Yep. So.